Welcome everybody, sorry for being late. Actually, it is time of uh, voting at the plenum of the Knesset. Voting, <coughs> sorry, voting on legislation. Uh, and this is the reason why we came late. And this is actually the reason why we will have to go, you know, and come back and go and come back. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you know, a very good way to keep the shape. <laughs> but uh, it's not very polite, but I hope that you will excuse us. Normally, uh, Wednesday at this time is a fine time uh, for making such discussions. But at the Knesset, there are sometimes uh, things that are not really expected. I think that this meeting we are having here today, uh, my colleague uh, M.K. Uh, Tamar Zandberg from Meretz Party and myself, M.K. Dov Henin from Hadash, uh, is very, very special and important one. Um, we uh, see the Middle East as an era uh, or a region where we are actually running against time. You know, all kinds of weapons, both new ones and all old, old ones, are you know, um, uh, threatening us. New kinds of weapons are entering this region all the time. And with the current situation of uh, uh, conflicts, military conflicts, uh, and even growing trends of all sorts of military conflicts, the consequences of uh, uh, this kind, both old and new, uh, kinds of uh, weapons of mass destruction can, can be uh, um, extremely harmful for all people here in the region. So we are trying to uh, put this issue also before or on the agenda of Israeli public opinion. It is uh, the interest of both Arab people and Israeli people to get rid of all kinds of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. So we are having discussion here at the Knesset on these issues. We had a very fruitful discussion a few months ago, also with the Sharon, that I would like to once more thank her for all her efforts and uh, you know fruitful activities on these issues. We had a, a very fruitful meeting on the consequences of what is called limited nuclear conflict. And we found out that limited is unlimited. <laughs> and the consequences of such conflict are totally harmful, not only to the countries that will be attacked by military, all kinds of military uh, installation or weapon, but the, co the, co the direct implications for the attacker also will be extremely bad. We are having these discussions to today on the issue of chemical and other kinds of mass destruction weapons. And it is an opportunity for me to welcome all of you. It is very, very uh, important for us to have you here at the Knesset. And I uh, do assure you that all the deliberations of this meeting uh, will be helpful for us in our struggle to get rid of uh, biological, chemical, and other kinds of weapons of mass destruction in Israel and the Middle East at large. So even while we are away, the records of this meeting are being kept. And uh, we will use the materials of this meeting to uh, try to um, um, persuade other MKs and other uh, people in uh, political authority in Israel that steps should be taken on these issues uh, very, very urgently. Thank you very much once more. Please, uh, MK Zander. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Dov. Thank you, Sharon, for organizing and actually being the, the living spirit around uh, this issue uh, in Israel. Uh, I would like to join um, member of Knesset Hanin's uh, apologize for us having to sometimes leave and come back, but also to apologize on behalf of other Knesset members who are not here and for the uh, somehow uh, um, limited uh, participation in, the, in this discussion. And I think uh, it's not by accident. It's not just because people have other things to do right now, even though, of course, they do, but also because uh, the existence of this discussion 
here in the Knesset is not obvious. Uh, Israel, as you probably know, uh, have a very famous and long-lasting ambiguity policy over the question of its nuclear possession. Um, and this ambiguity policy has somehow widened and is, uh, became a very, very wide umbrella around all the even public discussion and discourse over all kinds of, um, of weapons of mass destruction and unconventional uh, weapons. And uh, we belong to those in the Israeli society and in the parliament who think that this, uh, this uh, uh, policy is not only wrong, but is also harmful, first of all, for us, for the Israeli society that we represent, and also for the region uh, around us. Uh, and we feel that uh, this silence, and maybe we can say this shut down, because it's not, it's sometimes self-censorship, but it's also deliberate uh, policy, uh, prevents any kind of discussion about the damages, about threats, dangers, uh, about uh, opportunities to, to dismantle and to uh, move forward and pursue a better future. Uh, as we all, of course, uh, uh, understand and, and share the notion that uh, um, lives in peace and without the threats of any kinds of weapons, even, even the ones that you yourself possess, uh, is better. But somehow, uh, the, the fact that this discussion is not being held around any table, especially here in the parliament, uh, keeps even the hope and the vision of a clean Middle East, a clean world and for us uh, clean uh, Israel. Um, so we would like to thank you for coming here and in a way making us have this discussion and, uh, and, and deliver it uh, to the people that we represent and uh, we are doing uh, all the effort that we can to hold this discussion alive in all its aspects. Sharon is being very helpful uh, in that matter, and other people like uh, uh, Itai Mac, who is sitting here, and we work uh, a lot about the, the Israeli uh, ex um, export of uh, weapons and uh, weapon industries, who is also a, a very big uh, issue. Um, so thanks again, and we hope to learn from you, but also use your knowledge to widen the discussion in Israel. First, I think it's important to thank you, the two of you. It's not... Uh it's not taken for granted that we will be sitting here. Uh, Paul, who helped me, Paul from uh, International Green Cross, who helped me organize this, and that actually funded the, the roundtable's uh, process uh, uh, lately in Israel, the, the two days that we had, uh, asked me what would be a parameter of success for this event today, and I said that it happens. Uh, <laughs> we are here, that's it. <laughs> we can go now. Um, I think that uh, I'm going to say something that is uh, that, that all of you know. I don't. I'm not. Uh, I, I don't have to convince anyone here. But I'm going to say it anyway because it's such a pleasure to say it here in this building. Israel must go for the WFD free zone process. Israel must do it because it's for the benefit of Israel and it's for the benefit of the zone. Israel has the policy of doing nothing and thinking that by doing nothing they can have business as usual. But as of April 2015. Business is not going to be as usual. Apart from the fact that we are looking at a possible nuclear arms race in the Middle East starting May 2015, we can also see it, uh, look at the dangers of weapons of mass destruction falling to the hands of the non-state uh, non parties. And weapons of mass destruction in the hand of non-state parties is extremely dangerous because you cannot strike them back. Not that we would like to strike anyone with weapons of mass destruction, but the ability of non-state party to use weapons of mass destruction is very high. This weapon, as Dov mentioned, has no limits. It doesn't matter who used them. It doesn't have borders. It's non-discriminatory. And above everything, it's a weapon that aimed at, at civil society, not at armies, and is utterly unmoral. We have no discussion about it, and we won't move anywhere as long as there's no discussion in the parliament. Having two members of parliament talking about these issues is much more than we used to have uh, when it was none and before that one. So uh, 
we already have 200 percent more than we <laughs> more than we used to have, um, and it's not enough. Without ratifying the CWC, the Chemical Weapons Convention, we won't show that even when it's easy, we're willing to move forward. In these days, there's no reason for Israel not to ratify the, the CWC. Israel was one of the first uh, states to sign the CWC. It was Yitzhak Rabin himself who did it. Perez said that uh, we should do it, we should ratify it, and yet it's uh, 2014 and we haven't done that yet. There are no chemical threats uh, on Israel now, and there's no reason to hold it. Um, I would like to go directly, especially because we're uh, short on time, uh, I would like to go directly and I would like to, uh, to talk about our speakers and ask them to give you some information about their background and about the, what, what they do um, and leave you time to ask questions so we can have a conversation. I'll do it one by one and then uh, uh, I'll do it in Hebrew because uh, you know who you are. Um, <laughs> so I, I'd like to start with, uh, with Peter Sauzak from the OPCW, the Organization of the uh, Chemical Weapons Convention. Peter Achrayel Kishrei Mimshal, who is the Shachrayel to bring the Mimshalot and to make the Amana to Amana Universalit. Universalit, you understood. Yes. Please, Peter. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you very much. Uh, we were very heartened, obviously, by. Uh, your, your um, ambitions inside the Knesset, and uh, we're only too grateful for the opportunity to give you some arguments, perhaps, to assist your outreach efforts. Um, in the case of the CWC, I think these arguments are quite simple and, and very persuasive. Um, the CWC, the Chemical Weapons Convention, is easily the most successful arms control treaty in uh, multilateral disarmament history. I mean, it remains even 17 years since it entered into force the only international legally binding instrument that bans not only bans an entire class of weapons of mass destruction, but does so under international verification. That's very important. Our record so far over 17 years speaks for itself. We have now near universality of membership. As you know, we have 190 member states. So far, we have destroyed, verified the destruction of 86% of the world's declared chemical weapons. We have destroyed about 92% of all chemical weapon production facilities or converted them to civilian use. This record stands for itself and in fact was recognized, as you know, last year by the Nobel, uh, Norwegian Nobel Committee by awarding the OPCW, the implementing agency of the CWC, uh, Peace Prize. We've also been in an international limelight recently with the Syria mission, of course. Um, many people didn't know what we did because we were so successful. The Syria mission was a very rare opportunity to get rid of a major weapons of mass destruction arsenal anywhere in the world. It is one of the most optimistic stories of the, the recent years in, in, in the Middle East, you know. Absolutely. Something that, you know, was beginning to, to, to be a cause of not only great concerns, but dangers and uh, a lot of harm and um, solutions are working. And that's absolutely right. I mean, in fact, when the mission started, there was a lot of commentary in the media and even among the professional community to the effect that it couldn't be done. Um, but it was done. And uh, I think the fact that we were able to record such success uh, really says something about how effective the Chemical Weapons Convention is as a, as a treaty that actually is oriented towards practical results. Um, I think in relation to this background, I mean, there are three facts that are very relevant for Israel, which I'm, I'm sure you're very aware of, that Israel signed the Chemical Weapons Convention in 1993 when it opened for signature in recognition of the fact that it was in Israel's interests. We have also the fact that the strategic threat of chemical weapons from Syria has been removed. Uh, we have now, I think, 98% of the chemical weapons arsenal having been destroyed. Um, and we also and have the fact 98% of the chemical weapons have been destroyed less than a year after the decision to do, to do so. That's 100% of all of the most dangerous chemicals, and the, the fastest, sulfur mustard. The fastest ever, right? Well, the first time it's ever been done. <laughs> um, the other fact, of course, is that Syria, under whatever circumstances, is now a member of the CWC. Israel still is not. So 
Obviously, it's not my place or another government's place to uh, give advice to Israel what's in its national security interests. But I think it's very important in any consideration of what is in Israel's national security interest, in, including ratification of the CWC, is um, the fact that we all saw the international reaction to chemical weapons use in Syria. That only went to show how strong the global consensus is against chemical weapons. And it also went to show that the CWC is a global norm um, in practice. The second thing is that the success of the Syria mission showed that the Chemical Weapons Convention works. It is a successful treaty. Um, the third thing it showed was that there are six non-state parties to the chemical weapons left. Of those, three are soon to join the convention. Angola, Myanmar, and South Sudan, probably in coming months, will either accede or ratify to the convention. Certainly, they have publicly committed to doing so, which leaves Israel in the company of North Korea and Egypt. Um, Why Egypt? Well, um, there are various reasons for that. I think I won't speak on behalf of the Egyptian government, but I mean, uh, um, certainly Egypt uh, um, is, sees this more broadly in the context of uh, progress on a conference on weapons mass destruction. But I think we have an Egyptian colleague here who <coughs> might be able to respond I, to I that. Asked her. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we talk a lot. We talk a lot. <laughs> um, but so, in addition to these factors, there are very sound intrinsically valuable reasons for joining the Chemical Weapons Convention, specific for Israel. Membership would certainly not cut across any strategic options for Israel for the simple fact that chemical weapons cannot be used anymore. Nobody would ever use chemical weapons. They are taboo. The second thing is that membership would deliver diplomatic security and economic benefits to Israel. Now, I already said that I won't talk about national security interests uh, and, and won't presume anything on Israel's behalf. but. Very few people realize that Israel has a large chemical industrial lobby, a group, uh, industry here, and that by being a member of the Chemical Weapons Convention, it would have better access to so-called Schedule II chemicals, chemicals that are traded widely but do have possibilities in the chemical weapons program. So at this stage, Israel's chemical industry probably has to go around these effectively trade barriers. So there are very sound commercial reasons as well. Um, and the third aspect of membership, it would allow Israel to better engage and improve compliance and verification with the Chemical Weapons Convention. Um, Israel has had a lot of concerns about compliance on the nuclear side among regional countries. But by being part of a regime that has a strict verification regime, it can help shape that regime, and it could see ways of applying that regime more broadly, especially if discussion towards a weapons of mass destruction free zone, as Sharon has uh, expressed hopes for, advance further. So I think these are all very important factors that could usefully contribute to your arguments in relation to why Israel would do well to ratify the Chemical Weapons Convention without any compromise to its strategic options, um, including in relation to the nuclear side. So I think I might leave it there and obviously be available for questions. Thank you. Dina, would you like to answer why not Egypt, or do you want to leave it for later? Or? Welcome, to the, Welcome to the Knesset. We are happy to have you with us. The Egyptian position is not like a secret. We all know that Egypt is leading the efforts uh, internationally and regionally to have a WMZ free zone. We play a very strong role in that regard, and we think Israel should be engaged positively by, for example, ratifying CWC, joining NPT. But so far, we don't see any like hmm? real uh, willingness from the Israeli government to do so. That's why we think that we ratifying the CWC now won't be like a constructive step unless Israel will do it. Introduce Paul Walker. Uh, Paul was a focus uh, Nobel alternative. Uh, who is the chemia? We came to coalition, coalition of women against the chemia, CWCC. Who who better me who should be the chavra israelit to talk about the chemia. והוא המנהל של גרינקוס בינלאומי בארצות הברית. About half a year ago we met, uh, we met in New York right. and I asked Paul two, two things. One was uh, if he's willing to be a member of our international board, uh, IDM international board, and he said gladly. And then we thought what can we do together and I said I really want to have a CWC event in Israel and in the parliament, and he said, yalla. Let's do it, right? Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. And I, 
I guess I first should say I'm very comfortable here in the room because I used to work in the U.S. House of Representatives, and I was uh, policy director of the House Armed Services Committee, the Military Committee. So our room is a little bit larger than this. We had 56 members of the committee, I guess, and we had 75 staff. So, you know, it's just a big operation. But that was that was 20 years ago. Um, but since that time, I've worked uh, a good amount of time on the Chemical Weapons Convention, uh, largely because I was very fortunate to participate in the uh, first American on-site inspection of a Russian chemical weapons stockpile uh, in, the, in Siberia, east of the Ural Mountain Range. And we realized back in, this was July 1994, so it was 20 years ago, we realized back then how insecure these weapons were and how dangerous they were. Uh, that site itself, one of seven in Russia, had over two million nerve agent artillery shells uh, with almost no security on the site. Fortunately, today, security is pretty high on that site, and 75% uh, of that site has now been destroyed. Um, we also, I would mention, come from civil society. Uh, I coordinate something called the Chemical Weapons Convention Coalition. And we're really fortunate to, to be able to work with Sharon Dalev, and, and uh, we want to thank Sharon for helping this week or managing this week and organizing our seminar in Tel Aviv and this meeting in, uh, in here. The, uh, Peter has already talked a lot about the OPSW. I would just say I've worked with the OPSW and the Chemical Weapons Convention since we struggled in, the, in Washington in uh, 1997 to get it ratified. So I understand the politics. I think of parliaments and Congress, probably not so well the Knesset, but I understand the difficulties that uh, the different parties and ideologies present here. And I think we all understand the regional politics uh, a bit as well. Uh, we've just had two days of very good discussions. But I must say, uh, after 17 years in existence, the biggest uh, verified, inspected arms control regime in the world, uh, with very few countries remaining outstanding now, and, and the outstanding countries are becoming smaller and smaller, as, as Peter said, with, with uh, Angola, Myanmar, and um, South, South Sudan about to, within the next year, maybe sooner, about to join. It's really a very small group. And I don't see any downside to Israel joining. I really don't at all. I realize it's probably much more about the politics, uh, the ambiguity that you talked about uh, in weapons of mass destruction. But <clears throat> I think the positive upside is really quite large. And if we, if we can continue to work with civil society here and NGOs, and if we can work with chemical industry, which has been very, very supportive throughout the world, particularly in the United States and Western Europe, also in Russia, Japan, India as well, uh, I, think, I think you can, you should be able to ratify. It will take some discussion, I know. Uh, we'd all be happy to help and provide background material. We'd be happy to help and, and testify if that were appropriate. Uh, I think the OPSW, I know, would be very supportive. The Americans are 150% behind this. When I met with the American ambassador, who's an old friend uh, in Washington just before I came, I said, what should I say to the, uh, our Israeli colleagues? And he said, ratify, ratify, ratify. So <clears throat> I, I, I would just you know, finish by saying we're here to try to help and support you any way we can. Um, and I think you have really all the expertise you need around the room here, um, and with Sharon as well here. Uh, it should be doable in the foreseeable future. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I think that two things are uh, safe to say is that, yeah, in this room, you have the best brains uh, on the deals with uh, chemical and biological weapons uh, in the world. And I don't think that I'm exaggerating. Uh, and the other thing, talking about uh, benefits, if we want to convince other members of parliament, Israel today is the only state in the world that haven't ratified any of the major WMD uh, conventions apart from South Sudan, and South Sudan is only three years old, and, they ha and, and they're about to. I mean, they'll do it before us, and leave us again as the only state in the world. I would like to introduce uh, Jean-Pascal Zanders. If we talk about the people who are involved in this, he is the most important part. He is a researcher in biology, and he is the research in the field for CIPRI, which is the research for the development of the world. והיום כשהוא פרש ומשעמם לו, 
הוא יועץ למשלחות האיחוד האירופי לאמנות נגד נשק כימי וביולוגי, ומתחזק את אתר החדשות המרכזי בנושא. ג'אם פוסקל. I said only bad things. Thank you very much. I'm sure it's all correct. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great honor for me uh, to be here, to be part of the team uh, that Sharon has put together these uh, past days to discuss in depth uh, a number of the issues, uh, part really being educational, the other part uh, being, you know, discussions in uh, substance and now a political uh, dimension. Um, I, I would like uh, to focus uh, on one element that might actually be uh, very relevant to you. It's the role of Parliament not just with the ratification, but after ratification. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I think uh, Israel, it has been mentioned, signed the Chemical Weapons uh, Convention on uh, the 13th of January 1993. But it's uh, very important for you to, to bear in mind that Israel was actually a very active negotiating party uh, to the treaty. Uh, Israel, somewhere in your vaults, in your archives, you must have the working documents of how everything came together. At the same time, following uh, opening for signature, uh, Israel was uh, very active also in the PREPCOM, the preparatory committee, which is the precursor organization to the organization for the prohibition of uh, chemical weapons. And Uh, really was uh, very active in fleshing out all the details. Yesterday evening, I had the privilege to sit with a, a good old friend of mine who was part of that process. Unfortunately, he's paralyzed now, but uh, it brings back many good memories of those uh, discussions. What I want to say with that is uh, there is a lot of knowledge present in Israel in those archives. Okay. In, in terms, as I've uh, said, uh, okay. um, in, in terms of ratification, I've said, you know, being a parliamentary democracy, you will have to ratify any decision by the government to become a full party to this uh, convention. But then afterwards, the real work for parliament starts because Uh, there are a number of responsibilities under the treaty that are with the international organization and the international community. However, there is a division of labor and the state party itself undertakes quite a few responsibilities. And to be able to fulfill those responsibilities, it is necessary to adopt uh, different types of uh, legislation to make the whole operation of the convention uh, feasible. The first one uh, I would say, uh, for example, is uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention is about a prohibition. It's a total prohibition. There are no exceptions uh, to it. Obviously, as you know, an international treaty governs behavior between states. But at the same time, you want to make sure that none of the violations take place on your territory. That means that nationals, Israeli nationals, companies operating on Israeli territory, whether they're Israeli or foreign uh, companies, they must all be subjected to the same uh, rules. And for that, you need to adopt numbers of law. Also, uh, Israel will acquire uh, a number of uh, responsibilities in terms of collecting data on activities that are of relevance to the convention. For example, specific types of industrial production. Now, the government needs the authority to collect the necessary information because it must report it to the OPCW. <coughs> so that's a different aspect of uh, legislation that will need to be uh, adopted at uh, the same time. In the context of uh, terrorism, criminal activities, we are really looking at any toxic chemical. I mean, uh, the, co the convention, the Chemical Weapons Convention is uh, comprehensive. So you need uh, the types of law to be able to penalize, to criminalize. And uh, one characteristic of the convention is called the general purpose criterion. So it's not the poison as such that you prohibit, it's the application, the purpose the to which you apply it. And because of that, if you incorporate that concept of the general purpose uh, criterion 
in national law you can actually prevent and preempt terrorist attacks or criminal uh, activities because if the terrorist, the criminal cannot justify possession or acquisition of that toxic compound, they're already in violation of law. The, the final uh, element I um, would like to highlight, uh, this, uh, which is uh, part of the domestic implementation of the convention, is the national authority. National authority is a unit within government. It's up to Israel to decide whether they want to put it in the foreign ministry, ministry of economic affairs, defense, or whatever. It's uh, really uh, a sovereign uh, decision uh, there. However, it is a contact point for the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, so all diplomatic interaction uh, will happen uh, through that. However, uh, I think uh, from uh, Israel's uh, perspective, it is uh, equally important because that will be the point to which industry and all other uh, entities inside the country that need to supply information on certain types of activity, the focal point, national authority, will collect all that information for transmittal. But for you, it's also uh, an important tool to interact with other states' parties. The uh, national authority also builds lateral connections, which means if you have concerns about certain types of activities in other uh, countries, one of the first uh, types of activity, instead of using the megaphone and accusing people, is actually using uh, the national authority in the other country to seek clarification on the number of uh, items that can come out. And vice versa, if other countries have questions uh, about uh, Israel to seek clarification, to offer context to certain activities, that would be uh, the place uh, to uh, go to. Um, and. I think I, in general I'm going to stop there, but I just want to impress that once ratification is over, there's still a lot of work for Parliament and it's a responsibility <coughs> also of Parliament, uh, I think, uh, to get the quality of the legislation uh, in place. And it's a different dimension of national security, of course. Thank you. And I think that also it's uh, kind of safe to say that uh, if, if we have a move towards ratification, and if the MKs will need uh, some advice and uh, information that uh, you're the man to go to, right? I point I mean, you uh, as the special... Uh, yes, uh, I mean, obviously the, there are other people like from uh, Vertic here who have a lot of uh, expertise uh, in that. I'm always uh, available to assist. But I, I think at this point I should also say that uh, if ratification comes closer uh, in uh, Israel, that the OPCW can be contacted and offer assistance to get, they have a kind of a list of the various elements to have ideally in place in national legislation. I don't know uh, whether uh, Israel is one of those countries where implementation legislation must already be adopted upon ratification. There are a number of countries where it has to happen. But basically what I want to say is the technical secretariat in The Hague of uh, the OPCW, of which uh, Peter is a member, they have all kinds of outreach activities to assist uh, with that uh, process, even before ratification. In Myanmar, uh, for example, right now, they are having very intensive uh, interactions. And obviously, other states' parties, the United States in particular, will be more than happy to assist in uh, any way. And if you have concerns, uh, to take them away. Thank you very much, Anne Pascal. Uh, next speaker. Uh, you Chalmers uh, from Vertic. Vertic is one of the main organizations in the context of everything that is related to verification, the military investigation. He is a lawyer there. He is a member of the Committee of Security and Defense, which is a member of the Committee of Security and Defense, which is a member of the Committee of Security and Defense, which is a member of the Committee of Security and Defense, which is a member of the Committee of Security and Defense. You. Thank you very much for the introduction. I just told him that you look like Dr. Who. <laughs> it usually is a, is, a, is a great way to start. Um, first of all, I thank you both for taking some time out. It's obviously a very busy period to, uh, to talk to us and to, to listen to what we have to say on this topic. I'll try and keep my words short. Um, as Sharon said, I work for a, a non-governmental organisation in London. 
that researches the monitoring of treaties, and we also assist states uh, in signing up to various treaties. Um, and I want to take from what Pascal, Jean Pascal said um, about uh, the domestic implementation of the CWC and take it on to um, monitoring and verification, essentially. One of the, the greatest successes of the Chemical Weapons Convention is its uh, monitoring and verification mechanism, which really is it's seen by many as the gold standard of verification um, around the world. And I think there are two main reasons for this. Um, the first is that it's, it's very, very well organized to not put too much burden on a sensitive industry. Um, as has already been said, Israel has a very strong chemical industry, as do many other states around the world. And it's quite important that um, when, when they are inspected, to make sure that they are not um, breaking the convention, that it doesn't get too much in the way of the operation of these, uh, of, of these industries. So the inspection activities that the OPCW um, conducts are very carefully tailored, depending on how sensitive the industries are. For the least sensitive industries, only a few facilities are inspected every single year. If you're operating very, very sensitive chemicals, then naturally it's a little bit more rigorous. But it's very, very carefully tailored to ensure that it doesn't um, inhibit um, industry at all in the state. Um, also, um, there are very good mechanisms to discuss disputes or um, problems with verification. As uh, Jean Pascal said, there are many, many, many different channels um, between the, uh, the OPCW and a state and other states um, to talk about um, questions in terms of uh, adherence to the treaty. If there are indications that you know, chemicals may be where they weren't supposed to be or that there might be kind of odd looking activities going on, there are many different channels. States can talk to other states. They can arrange small bilateral meetings. It's a very um, flexible process. And it's quite telling that so far, um, there are a number of different tools that can be used um, to discuss potential non-compliance issues. Only the most basic ones have really been used to date. Um, there have been no huge fallouts. There have been no big um, problems with the verification mechanism at all. Um, so far. So it's proven itself to be extremely effective. And indeed, a lot of other treaties look to the Chemical Weapons Convention for examples on how to go about monitoring and verifying treaties. Big ideas for, uh, for nuclear, um, some ideas for biological, look to the Chemical Weapons Convention for ideas on how to do it. And importantly, there's a huge amount of assistance uh, available to make sure these systems work properly. Um, I'll turn again to the OPCW, the Technical Secretariat, um, is extremely, extremely good in providing assistance with states to catalogue all the chemicals that they have, to describe all the different activities that they have, and communicate them properly to the OPCW. So whilst the, the, the verification system is very, very effective, it's also quite easy to implement and doesn't really get in the way of domestic industry. So um, I'll just try and leave it at that. Simple. Thank you very much, you. Wilbert van der Zijden, is a member of the WMD Free Zone. התחיל איתנו את התהליך בתור הכיסוי הבינלאומי שלנו כשפה לא רצו לדבר איתנו והפחידו אותנו. הוא מארגון ההולנדי פאקס, זה ארגון שעוסק באזורי סכסוך. וולבוט הוא חוקר שכותב ועוסק בנושא נשק גרעיני, נשק להשמדה המונית, נאטו וכלכלת נשק גרעיני. לאחרונה הוא הוציא דוח, לאחרונה זה לפני שבוע, הוא הוציא דוח מעודכן, אתם פגשתם אותו, אני לא יודעת אם אתם זוכרים, עם Don't Bank on the Bomb, uh -huh. והדוח uh -huh. המעודכן מראה בין השאר שבנק הפועלים הישראלי משקיע 20... 20 מיליון דולר? 27 מיליון. 27 מיליון דולר או פאונס? 27 מיליון דולר ב-80K, עליי אין טכנית. בתוכנית הטילים הגרעינית הבריטית. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Do, do I speak now? Because the, the bell. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. no. um, I'm, I'm going to keep it short anyway. I think, uh, I think it's been clear already from the presentations that the focus this time uh, in, in this very lovely uh, two days that we've had with Sharon uh, was on the Chemical Weapons Convention and, and the possibilities for Israel maybe to ratify. Um, I, think it's, I think it's important, and that's my contribution in this discussion, to recognize that this is, of course, part of the larger discussion. Uh, that we're in the midst of, uh, of a weapons of mass destruction free zone for the Middle East. And I just wanted to remind or bring up that I believe that a very important decision-making moment um, is very much around the corner or, or already sort of in the street in the sense that um, 
the parties convening the conference that we had been promised on this uh, weapons of mass, mass destruction free zone um, are undertaking a last attempt to get all the parties to the table. Um, so I'm just here to remind uh, uh, both the Israeli government but also Israeli Israelis engaged in this debate um, that this decision is, is now uh, being taken whether or not before the, um, the, uh, the new, nucle the new uh, non-proliferation treaty review conference in April, there will actually be this first conference for all parties to engage in discussions on this regional zone. Um, it's not my position to say what Israel should do. We have talked a lot again the past two days on uh, what the pros and cons are, what the, what the obstacles are for Israel to join uh, discussions like that. Uh, what I took away from the past two days is that the new, uh, the new discussions around the Chemical Weapons Convention show that ch things can change, show that an engaging discussion on these issues can help to overcome differences in the region. Uh, so I, all I can say is that I hope that Israel will participate in, uh, uh, in a constructive manner in, uh, in discussions like that. The other, if I may, uh, uh, very last thing is that I understand from Sean that, that at least one of you, or maybe even both of you, uh, are thinking of participating or are interested in participating in the Vienna conference. Uh, I will be there as well. I think it's, it's going to be a great conference also to engage in many of these debates, but from a different angle slightly. Um, and you promise cake. I, I promise cake and I uh, promise to uh, assist you in any other way possible if, uh, if we encounter each other there. We also have here Lenny Siegel. היי לני. לני הוא מנהל המרכז הציבורי לפיקוח סביבתי בארצות הברית, הוא נחשב לאחד המומחים המובילים לזיהום ממתקנים צבאיים וחדירת עדים רעילים מהקרקע למבנים, הוא מנהל פורום צבא וסביבה וכל אחד מאיתנו מקבל מייל יומי ממנו עם חדשות בתחום, זה תחום לא מאוד מאוד ישן אבל תחום מאוד חשוב, אחד הדברים שהוא מראה זה שמלחמה שלא צריך מלחמה כדי שיהיו אבדות, אימונים ובסיס צבאי עצמו זה דבר מסוכן. על אותו, פחות או יותר על אותו מישור, יש לנו את דאג, וואר, שם, הבריטי, שהוא מנהל פרויקט שרידים רעילים של מלחמה, והוא רכז הקואליציה הבינלאומית לאיסור על נשקי אורניום, כולל אורניום מדולל. אחד המחקרים שלהם מראים שלמרות שבישראל בעיקרון אין שימוש באורניום מדולל, שזה אותם חומרים... חודרי שריון שגרמו להרבה מאוד סרטן בקרב חיילים אמריקאים, כן ישראל קנתה, קיבלה בזמנו אורניום, מטילים של אורניום כזה, כנראה לא עשתה בהם שימוש. עורך דין קספר הלל, הוא יועץ עצמאי בתחום זכויות האדם ופתרון קונפליקטים, הוא עובד כיועץ ומנהל פרויקטים עבור גרין קרוס שוויצריה, מתמקד בנשק כימי ונשקים להשמדה המונית, הוא בעצם היועץ שלנו, של התנועה דרך גרין קרוס שוויצריה. Uh, יש כאן את איתי מק, uh, שבין uh, שאר מעלליו שאתם uh, מכירים, הגיש עכשיו עתירה uh, בנושא ישראל ונשק כימי, עתירה ראשונה מסוגה אבל לא אחרונה, uh, הוא אוהב ללכת עם עטרה על הגב. Uh, ולאסט בוט נוט ליסט, אור פרנד דינה, פרום דה אג'יפשן אמבסי, שכמו שאתם יודעים זו פעם ראשונה שהשגרירות המצרית uh, כל כך... Uh, Engaged בשיח אזרחי. So, אם יש לכם שאלות, מי כן. מהם? Uh, לא שאלות, אלא אני הייתי מציע שנתקדם לאיזשהו yeah, סוג של סיכום. Well, uh, first of all, let me once more thank you for your uh, visit here at the Knesset. Uh, your uh, comments um, are extremely important for us. Uh, my personal suggestion for the sum of of this meeting is that uh, Sharon, perhaps with the help of this uh, very capable person around the table, perhaps there is a possibility of writing a kind of um, proposal uh, for Israeli gov government. What should be the way forward concerning chemical weapons? What are the main arguments? What are the main answers to the questions or the doubts that some people in Israeli establishment still have concerning uh, moving forward. I think such a paper can be very influential and can help us, you know, lead the next step of the struggle 
in order to make some change here in Israel. So if after this meeting it is possible to gather all the material and to uh, sum it to some kind of a very clear paper for uh, decision makers with all the main arguments and the uh, conclusions you made during these two days here in Israel, I think this can be extremely helpful for us in our next steps here in Israeli Knesset. First of all, thank you all for coming here uh, to Israel, to the Knesset, to this uh, specific uh, discussion. Um, and I join uh, my colleague uh, Zov's proposal. I think that maybe we can, uh, together, after getting this material, we can uh, uh, finalize it into a, like a proposal or a letter to, uh, to the Israeli government, to the Prime Minister and Minister of Defense, and very, maybe I can even say innocently or naively, suggest that Israel ratifies uh, and, of course, present all the arguments with the very, very uh, um, reputation of, of, uh, of the present uh, experts and uh, present to them that this is their recommendation of this and that uh, organizations, uh, former officials, um, presenting all the countries that already scientists. adopted, the, yeah, and scientists, and, and present all the advantages, and maybe even start answering some of the concerns that uh, the Israeli officials might have. And I think any answer that we get, no matter what answer it will be, can help us uh, move forward and uh, understand what can the next step be. I, I don't think that, uh, I, I think that we, we should expect and demand uh, an answer from Israeli governmental officials and uh, and then we can you know we can think together gather back this very very distinguished uh, table um, for a celebration yeah for no, either for a celebration <laughs> or for a consilium what can can be done next oh, because uh, I believe that yeah I know but I believe that uh, you know determined Sometimes even determined few can can make a change, and uh, the, the, I think that the main uh, challenge for us now in Israel is the uh, um, disengagement of everybody. It's not so much the op the opposition or that I don't identify uh, much of of uh, of uh, I don't know disconsent, but but rather indifference. So this is the what we have to break through now. This is the first step. Uh, if we get opposition, I think it will be good news because then we can crumble the arguments and start to break them one by one. But uh, the reality now that this topic is untalked about at all is, is I think, our number one enemy. And uh, the good news is that it's relatively easy to attack because all we need to do is scratch a little bit and ask for the answers. And this is what we take to our, you know, action with with the grateful help of, of all you guys. Other good news is that all these distinguished panels sat yesterday with the uh, Israeli National Security Studies uh, representatives, so they already heard oh. and argued Oh. about the Israeli position, so they know exactly what they're facing. From the official, from the... Um, um, so they know exactly what you're going to be faced with and what argument you're going to be facing. Right. If I could add one thing, too. You may be aware, but the Israeli Foreign Ministry attends the annual meeting in The Hague every year. So they, <clears throat> they have one representative who comes. The, uh, the woman right now is, is Tamar Rahimamov Honish, who's head of the arms control division in the foreign ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice, very nice woman. Um, they come as, as an observer. They sit with us way back in the peanut gallery with the NGOs and international organizations and Red Cross, Green Cross, and all the rest. Um, and, and they've lately, the last two or three years, I think, uh, given a plenary presentation uh, as not as a state party, but as an observer country mm -hmm. and a signatory to the treaty, before the 190 delegations from the, across the world. So, 
Israel, you know, formally having signed the treaty, continues to act as a partial member of it. And they've also told us several times, whether or not it's true, I don't know, but they've told us that Israel does not have a chemical weapons stockpile. But that's, of course, the point of ambiguity. So we've also been engaged. a very good argument for uh, ratifying the... Yeah, exactly. If you don't have one, why worry? Why not? Right. But you can also argue, too, that, you know, we have 25 years of experience now in destroying chemical weapons stockpiles of every type and shape and weapon system and agent and old and new and leaking and non-leaking and rockets and mortars and landmines. So there's a lot of experience, a lot of help uh, from the OPSW and also the state parties, particularly the Americans, the Germans, the Russians, uh, the Swiss and others, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Indians, South Koreans who've really engaged in weapon, physical weapons demilitarization. So if there is a stockpile, um, it's, it shouldn't be a problem. The first point I wanted to make was um, recall a comment Sharon made in her introductory remarks uh, two days uh, ago, and that is um, in the meetings at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons when destruction is discussed, when Syria is uh, discussed, the Israeli delegation of representative must leave the room. And I think uh, this uh, really caught my attention because if there is a security interest for Israel, it is to be privy to those types of uh, discussions and get first-hand uh, information. And during those discussions also to be able to intervene because the CWC, it's good to be party to it, but it's also a security regime. It's about uh, managing security of states. It's a different tool. The second element uh, which uh, Paul uh, mentioned uh, brings me to mind that should Israel have a stockpile, and I don't think it does, but you never know what's in uh, the closet somewhere. Um, if Israel joins and that decision has been taken internally, it can get rid of those weapons. It, if it does so before ratification, it does not have to declare itself as a chemical weapons possessor, which psychologically might be important uh, internally. France has done it. Other countries uh, have done so. Iran, for example, is one of uh, the countries. So should there be any you know, um, hesitation because of skeletons falling out of the closet, there's still a way of dealing with it. So it's also a kind of argument me, not publicly, but uh, internally, that could be advanced. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you. everybody. Thank you for and uh, let's hope that uh, next time we will meet uh, to celebrate. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you.